Mark chapter 9 is where we're going here this morning. Mark chapter 9, and uh, beginning at verse 14, we're looking at the story of uh, Jesus healing um, this uh, boy with an unclean spirit and kind of all the different dynamics that go on it between Jesus and the disciples, Jesus and the crowd, and, um, and uh, kind of look at it from a bit of a different angle maybe for some of us. So Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 14, um, writes this, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them. Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has he been? Has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the clean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he rose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you again for uh, this opportunity to gather, uh, Lord, saints and seekers, God, um, wanting to seek you, to seek your face, to seek uh, more of you, Lord God, in your presence, in answers maybe to questions, uh, seeking more of your power in our lives to overcome our weaknesses and, and our failings, uh, to, uh, to walk as you walk. And so, God, I pray that as we meet here together, as we have worshipped you and your amazing presence and and interaction with your creation, um, God, I pray that you would, again, um, stir up hope into our lives, stir up hope into our hearts. May we once again recognize the power that is in us because of a relationship with Christ, because of the very power of the gospel. And so, God, I pray that you would draw us, wherever we are on our walk and on our journey towards you, God, that you would help us to take a next step, whatever that next step might be. And God, as we turn to your word again, um, we thank you for its authority in our lives. We ask for your forgiveness where we do not always surrender to it. We do not always submit to it. We try to make it fit into our own own ideas, our own philosophies. But God, help us to, uh, to, to study it, read it, to apply it as you have meant it to be. And for that, we need your Holy Spirit. And so, Spirit, again, we ask for you to fall upon us afresh, fill us anew, and lead us into our time here into your word. Um, Father, again, I just humbly ask that you would bless the the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, and that, again, they would be honoring and glorifying to you, to you above all, that you would use them in some way as, as a tool, as a conduit, Lord, to bring much glory to yourself. to to equip the saints, and to build your church. So we surrender under your authority here today. Lead us, we pray, in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. If I can just get you to click on our PowerPoint there, Marv, and get us started. Perfect. Thank you. A fellow by the name of Jack London, who was an, an author many, many years ago, he said this. He said, if a thing is worth doing... It's worth doing well. 
If it is worth having, it is worth waiting for. If it is worth attaining, it is worth fighting for. If it is worth experiencing, it is worth putting aside time for. Someone also once said, good things come to those who wait. Humankind, mankind, we are not accustomed to waiting. We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait. And this isn't just a modern-day problem, right, with all our technologies and our, you know, our microwave popcorns and all our you know, wonderful gadgets that we have. This isn't a modern-day problem of waiting. In fact, it goes right back to the garden, wasn't it? That was the demand that Adam and Eve had. They demanded to be like God now. If you simply just take from this, this tree, if you just eat from this fruit, your eyes will be automatically open, and you will be like God. They wanted instantaneous They couldn't wait. They couldn't wait for their their relationship with God to to flow and to build and and to mature. They wanted it now. And so this was the temptation that they couldn't wait. And it led to the sin, which led to the death of us all, spiritually speaking. It was this idea of waiting and the art of waiting. The art of waiting is what we often call is patience. Patience. Patience takes practice. Patience takes time to develop. Again, it is a very unnatural game for mankind. And yet, inevitably, patience is something that we all must pursue. It's something that we inevitably all must practice at some point in some time. Because we're constantly on this journey uh, forward, aren't we? Right? We can't wait for you know, the first steps. We can't wait for, the, you know, for them to be independent and our kids to, to run around. We can't wait to, to get our license. We can't wait to vote. We can't wait to get out of the house. We can't wait to get our jobs and make money and buy things. We just simply can't wait for anything anymore. We are obviously always wanting to get to that next step, and yet a lot of the time it comes to the hurry up and wait stage. The hurry up and wait. Because sometimes there's nothing really that we can do. It has to be time that just goes forward. Time will tell, we say. Time heals, we say. It's this idea of waiting and patience, that something worth having is worth waiting for. Uh, this, uh, this past week, I don't know if you heard the news or not, but uh, Jen and Andrew became grandparents. They're not even here this morning to celebrate with us. Um, but Jen and, and Andrew Waddell, they became grandparents, and now we officially can call them Gramps and Grams. Um, but uh, their, their daughter-in-law, their soon-to-be daughter-in-law, uh, Chelsea gave birth to little Evelyn on uh, Wednesday morning. And they'd waited for this little bundle of joy about nine months, give or take a few days. And what a joy, what a celebration. Um, and just Jen, anytime you talk to Jen and, and Andrew, they just couldn't talk enough about this, uh, this little baby-to-be. And so now she is finally here. But I kind of thought, you know what, that's, it's kind of this waiting, isn't it, right? From the moment you recognize that there's a pregnancy, there's a birth, there's a, a new thing that's going to be done, the waiting game starts. The waiting game takes place. Did you know, when we think about pregnancies, did you know the elephant, the gestation period of an elephant is 21 months? 21 months. Oh, my word. Just, just a few months shy, five weeks or so, or no, it was, uh, yeah, about five weeks, six weeks, sort of, shy of two years being pregnant. Can you imagine? Can you imagine waiting like that? It's hard for us to imagine. And yet, when those, when those 95 weeks or whatever it is that an elephant uh, is, is pregnant, oops, Oh, I'm behind in my things here. There we go. Even though, right, they wait about 640 days, about 95 weeks, um, when that little baby elephant comes about, they couldn't be more happier. They forget about that previous two years, I'm sure, even though an elephant is said never to forget. But they're happy. They're ecstatic. They welcome it into the herd, as it were. And they say it was worth the wait. So it doesn't matter if it takes nine months. It doesn't matter if it takes 22 months. When we think about this gift of life, when we think about this this birth, it doesn't matter how long you wait. 
as long as there's this celebration, this, this birth at the end of it, this new life at the end of it. Last Sunday, we started a series on uh, the fruit of the Spirit, found in Galatians chapter 5. We started to talk a little bit about love and joy and peace. And we're going to kind of continue on in that as, as we look at the life of Christ and how we, as, as, as disciples of Christ, we begin to overcome um, our fleshly side, the desires that we had prior or, or, or trying to purge ourselves of in our lives of Christ. And so Paul encourages us with the fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, and peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, all these things in order to keep in step with the Spirit, to keep up, to follow along, to, to come alongside, and, and to let the Spirit lead us and guide us, to mature us and to grow us. But when we think about the Christian life, it is very much dependent upon a patience, isn't it? It is a waiting process for many of us. And sometimes we don't like that. We like to be farther than we should be, or we like to be farther than we ought to be, or we want to get more. And so it's this idea of patience. The, the life of a disciple of Christ deals a lot in patience. Someone once said, though, patience is not simply the ability to wait. It's how we behave while we're waiting. It's not just simply pulling up to a, uh, to a, to a red light at a busy intersection. But it's how we conduct ourselves while we are waiting there. Because we're forced to wait either way. The traffic is there. They've hemmed us in. We're stuck there no matter what. We're waiting no matter how we feel about the situation. But patience is how we deal with that situation. Do we take that time and we, we value that time and we, we make something of it? How we conduct ourselves while we are waiting is patience at its core. Now, we've been talking a lot about missions this week, and obviously missions emphasis weekend, if you will. And when we think about missions, often the, the, the main factor that we don't think of is waiting, is patience. How do these ones who, who go out in, into parts of the world unknown, how do they you know, begin ministries in the inner city of, of Saskatoon and, and simply wait? In fact, Heather, when, uh, Heather Hahn, uh, who was here with us on Friday, um, when she kind of did, did a bit of a, an orientation with us when we first got there this time around, um, she said the, the, a big part of it is just simply practicing presence with people. Because when we get there, we want to be all gung-ho. We want to start getting to the job done and rolling up our sleeves. We want to start talking to people and interacting with people. We just want to get things done. That's sort of our mindset. But she says the most important thing that you can possibly do with whoever you're interacting with is just practicing presence, being patient, being all there with them and not going on to that next step. It's quite interesting when we think about uh, uh, building and missions and, and, and evangelizing and building disciples, and it takes years, decades, and sometimes to build trust, to build relationships, to build inroads into people's lives. We don't like that sometimes because we want to get the job done. And so patient isn't always a, a strong suit for us. I read briefly again uh, this week uh, some, some biographies of some international uh, missionaries who practiced and cultivated the characteristic of patient perseverance. Uh, some of you may, may, may uh, know some of these. Oops, there we go. Or did I go too far? I'm going backwards. Is there time to practice patience? There we go. Some of you may recognize some of these names here. Uh, William Carey, uh, who was uh, a missionary to India, made some great inroads into the country of India, was there for 41 years, each and every day. Uh, Adon Adoniram Judson, um, along with his, uh, his wife, spent 38 years in Burma. 
Uh, Hudson Taylor, an amazing story. If you've never read the story of Hudson Taylor, you ought to, because he made some amazing inroads into China. While most of the missionaries were just kind of landing on the coasts of China and kind of setting up ministries there, his heart was for the inland of China. And he didn't just go in there with Western practices and Western ideas. He wanted it to be uh, as, as it was one of their own. And so he dressed like them. Obviously, the first thing he started to do was, was to learn their language. He looked like them, shaved his head, grew one of those big, long Chinese ponytails at the time because um, he wanted it to be so much integration that he built an amazing trust, amazing relationship. And it took 51 years as they started ministries there. David Livingstone uh, in Zambia, uh, 34 years he was there and actually died while he was kneeling by his bedside praying for the many people that he ministered to. Uh, Heather Hahn, we got to hear on Friday, she's been in Mexico City almost 20 years. We don't think about it. But she's been there 20 years. And if you were here on Friday, you heard there's triumphs and there's testings. Not everything goes great and well. And yet, with patience and perseverance, she continues to trust in God for the seeds that are being planted. Uh, obviously, as we talk about here this morning in ministries like Hands On and The Bridge, uh, Hands On celebrating 25 years of work. 25 years of work. It's patience that gets the job done often. Because we dismiss sometimes that idea of patience, of just simply working with people. We miss the practicing of patience when we think of kindness and goodness. Doing that in the midst of waiting patiently. Waiting for God to open doors of opportunity in order to preach the gospel, in order to approach the subject of Jesus Christ in many circumstances and situations. Some have often said that Jesus was the very first Christian missionary. He was one who left his home, as it were, his heavenly home. He emptied himself of sort of all his privileges and and he, he emptied himself, as Philippians says, of any uh, uh, the privileges that he may have had. Um, he took on the form of those that he was going to minister to. He took on human form. He talked like they did. He ate like they did. He looked like they did. And he worked among the least and the lost and the distant, those farthest away from God on all accounts. Jesus was this one who went. He took literally the challenge that he gave to his disciples to go, to make that difference in people's lives. And he was a man of great patience, Jesus. Great patience and kindness and goodness. And as we see in our passage here this morning, this is how he implemented it with his followers and with his, the seekers that came to him. It was patience. How he took time with them. How he... He, he spoke into their lives. A bit of background is quite interesting. In, in, uh, the Gospel of Mark is, uh, is often said to be the oldest of the Gospels. Um, some scholars actually believe that uh, Matthew and Luke both used Mark uh, along with their own interactions uh, with others um, to, to create their own Gospels. And so Mark is almost sort of that, that foundational of the Gospels. And once you read through it, you'll see that it doesn't quite have all the, uh, uh, um, uh, all the stories to it, per se. It doesn't have all the, uh, the, the, the details of Luke or all the Jewish traditions of Matthew. But Mark really kind of gets to the point of it all. And so we turn into our passage in Mark chapter 9. And it starts off with this amazing story of what is often called the transfiguration. Jesus and the three, the inner circle of the three, the ones that he really spent a lot of time on with, with Peter and James and John, they are up on a mountaintop, we are told, and all of a sudden this amazing scene happens. Almost this, 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 these two worlds begin to sort of open up. And as Mark records, all of a sudden Jesus is standing there with Elijah and Moses. And the three, the disciples there, they don't quite know what's going on. In fact, the passage says that they were terrified. They didn't know what to say. So there's this amazing uh, uh, interaction that is happening here. It's sort of this mountaintop experience. For not only for, for Jesus, obviously, 
He gets this amazing uh, interaction with this, this heavenly world again. But also for these disciples who begin to see that there's so much more to Jesus than meets the eye. But the story doesn't end there. The story continues on in our passage here this morning. As the disciples and Jesus come down from this mountaintop experience, they enter into really what is a, 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 almost a very stressful situation. How many of you have ever come back from a vacation or a holiday into a very stressful situation? Right? You find something's wrong, you know, the basement's flooded, or you found out maybe somebody's sick and in the hospital, right? It, it just almost never seems to fail sometimes, right? You think about that was just the greatest week we had, and it was so awesome. Then you come back, and right, there's, you know, your cat's floating in the basement or something. I don't know. He's still alive. Don't go there. But, okay. But so this is what's happened. They've come from this transfiguration. They've seen this other world open up. And in fact, at one point, this voice from heaven says, this is my beloved, listen to him. And so they're on this mountaintop experience. Then they come down, and as our passage says, the disciples are, are at the bottom of the hill. The disciples that were left down there, they are arguing with the scribes. They're in a debate. They're fighting with the scribes, with these religious secretaries. That's what the scribes were. They were sort of the dictatorials. They knew uh, things about the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were sort of the religious um, uh, uh, bean counters of the day, if you will. And so Jesus comes down with the disciples. They come to the bottom, and there's this, this very stressful, chaotic situation. The disciples that were left were, were, are now debating with the religious secretaries, and, and Jesus wants to get to the bottom of this. And he finally asks, well, what are you arguing about? What's going on here? Right? I can't leave you guys for five minutes. Ever do that? Yeah, with your kids? No? Apparently it's just my kids. Um, and so they're trying to get to the bottom of it. And this morning as I was reading through uh, this passage again, um, it just struck me. So Jesus asked this question. There's a stressful situation going on. Jesus asked the question, what are you guys arguing about? Verse 17 says, and, and, and someone from the crowd answered him. Someone from the crowd, and then we get the main, one of the main characters of this story is this father with his demon-possessed boy. But Mark simply describes him as someone from the crowd. He is the one who sparks this, this arguing, this debate. This man who brings his son, who from, from, from childhood, the spirit has, has caused muteness, has caused deafness, has caused convulsions, has thrown him into fires trying to destroy and hurt and harm this child. This father brings him to, to Jesus, he suspected, not knowing that Jesus was up on the mountain. And, and he brings him to the disciples and saying, please help me. And then all of a sudden, they can't do anything. The disciples are unable to do it, the passage says. And then all of a sudden, this argument breaks up. And where does this hurting father end up going? He's back into the crowd. The disciples have just said, you know what? It's more important to debate doctrine. It's more important to debate the teachings and why we are unable to do this. It's more important to talk about religion with these scribes than to worry about this man who was pleading to have a healing for his son. These disciples have lost the whole point of ministry, the whole point of mission, the whole point of their life in Christ was to reach those ones that were hurting, to reach those ones who were at a loss and who came to Jesus trying to find healing and freedom. Simply someone from the crowd breaks through and said, well, I brought my son to you. Your disciples were unable to do it. It seems like a very sad situation, doesn't it? The disciples kind of just pushed this father and the boy aside because they wanted to go and debate. They wanted to get to the doctrine of it all. Why can't we do this? What's happening? And the father has to finally break through. Imagine... Jesus responds. He's been training and teaching and discipling these disciples for almost three years. 
It's not too far until we get to, to the, the triumphal entry, almost sort of the, the, the Palm Sunday and, and into, uh, into the Passion Week here in Mark. And so he's been with these disciples two, two and three quarter years. He's been trying to teach them everything. And yet these disciples are unable to do it. And we begin to see a picture that Jesus is getting here. And he, he simply says in verse 19, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? When we read these, uh, read these, these questions of Jesus, it seems that Jesus is being quite impatient here, doesn't he? Why are you? Like, how long do I got to be with you guys? You're just not getting it. We've been together almost three years, and you're still not understanding it. I'm teaching you. I'm discipling you. I'm showing you power. I have given you authority over demons and to heal the sick. You've gone out and proclaimed the gospel already on your own. And now again, you're not getting it. You've picked, you've pushed the, the greatest needs into the background again. And it almost seems that Jesus is, is losing his cool here a little bit. That he's almost being a bit impatient is when I, when I first read this passage. But then we have to understand what patience really is. When we think of the fruit of patience, what does it mean? Patient is not what we think of in our modern terms. Patience is not a passive-aggressive, twiddling our thumbs, waiting for life to, to hand us something better. That is not what patience is. Patience is not idly waiting. Patience is not acting in wrath or anger and throwing our hands in the air and stomping off. Jesus doesn't say, how long I got to be with you? That's it. I'm going to pick another 12. We don't see that, do we? Obviously, Jesus is frustrated. I get that. Obviously, Jesus is disappointed in his disciples. You should be farther along than you really are. But we don't see Jesus passively sitting by. We don't see Jesus idly waiting for his disciples just to magically and mysteriously mature. We don't see Jesus going off in this wrath and anger sort of thing. What we see with Jesus here in this response is patience. A patience that is uncommon to us in our culture. In fact, some of us have maybe heard um, the saying that patience is a virtue. Anybody hear that before? Yeah. Really where that comes from is uh, going back into, uh, back into like 410 A.D., uh, there was a Christian governor, actually, and, uh, and he said for the, the deadly sins that we actually see in, uh, in the Old Testament, of lust and gluttony and greed and sloth, he, he kind of created these virtues to counteract them. And when we go down the list, we see that this virtue, that patience is the virtue, and the opposite of that is wrath, is wrath. So patience is to counteract wrath and anger. It's to keep us calm. It's to keep us motivated, if you will. And Jesus does not have wrath here. Frustration, disappointment, absolutely. But Jesus is quite patient given the circumstance of the situation. In fact, throughout the New Testament, we see God's patience with us. Frustration? Yeah, absolutely. Disappointment? Yes, definitely. But God is very patient with us. Romans chapter 9, verse 22, it talks about how God is patient with us as vessels of wrath in order to make known the riches of his glory by making his vessels of mercy. He wants to see us changed. He wants to see us transformed. And he's not just simply waiting for it to happen. Boy, I wish Jason would just get that this week. Oh, I'm waiting for him. Oh, boy, oh, boy. No. He's actively patient with me. He's bringing things into my life. He's bringing situations. He's bringing people. He's bringing books and teachings. He's bringing all kinds of things. He's not simply waiting around for things to happen in my life. 
God is practicing patience with me actively. Second, or first Peter chapter 3, verse 9, talks about this idea that God is patient with us, not wishing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. This is an act of patience that God has with all people, with this world. God is patient with us. That doesn't mean he doesn't get frustrated. It doesn't mean he doesn't get disappointed when he brings things our way and we're just not getting it. I thought of it as a, as a parent. As a parent, again, a vision, you teaching your child how to walk. Think of the hours that you spent, you, you coach, you train. Remember the, the back-breaking things, you got them hanging off you like this, and you do it for how long? Constantly, don't you? Right? You're constantly jumping to see that they're not going to totter and hit their head on something. Do you get frustrated? Sometimes you do. Do you get disappointed? Oh, I thought today was the day. But do you give up? You don't give up. You try it again. A few more hours or the next day. And all of that simply to get one celebrated first step on their own. That's patience. Coaching. Coaxing. Picking us up time and time again when we fall. Wiping off the dirt. Kissing the boo-boos. That's what God does with us. He's patient with us. It's not a passive patience. It's not a sitting around waiting for things to happen on our own. God is patient, actively pursuing patience, practicing patience with us. That's what we see with Jesus here in our passage this morning. Patience with the disciples. And we're going to see in a little bit patience with uh, the seekers that are coming after him. This father in particular. But the challenge with us is for patience. As God has been patient with you, lovingly drawing you, coaching you, coaxing you, wanting you to see that that next step, who might God want you to be practicing more patience with? A practical patience. A persevering patience. Some of us are in relationships. Some of us have friends. Some of us have have, have friends that have never taken the gospel in, and, and, and sometimes you just get so frustrated with them. Say, like, how do you not get this? Or sometimes they keep going back to the same sins that we just try to, you know, coach and, and coax them out of. They keep going back. And we just get so frustrated. But who might God be calling you to be more patient with? As we think of this making disciples seeing people come to Christ. Because it needs to be in the long haul. It's not days. It's probably not even weeks. It's probably not even months. Let's face it, to make disciples, to make make people, to, to missions, it takes years. It takes years. To see them come in a very real way to Christ. How can we be more patient with those around us as we display Christ's goodness? We begin to see Jesus' uh, patience when dealing with the Father. The Scripture says that as as the Father brings the boy to Jesus right away, uh, the the Spirit uh, sees Jesus immediately, throws the boy into a convulsion, He falls on the ground, he rolls around, he's foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asks, how long has this been happening? And the father says, well, since childhood, he cast him into the fire, cast him into the water, wanting to destroy him. And then he says these words, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Remember, right, he's brought him to the disciples. The disciples have kind of thrown up their hands and say, we're unable to do this. But we're going to go and study the situation and uh, debate some doctrine, and, uh, and then we'll come back to you, okay? And so we can see a little bit of the frustration the Father has, because now, well, your disciples couldn't do anything, your followers couldn't do anything, 
And so all of a sudden, he's starting to have a doubt about Christ himself. I initially came to you with my kid. I had to deal with your minions. They couldn't do much. But if you can do anything, help us out. We begin to see the frustration here, don't we? And then all of a sudden, we get these words of Jesus in verse 23. Jesus said to him, the father, if you can... Basically say, well, where, where is that faith that you once came to me with? Even just that, 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 that mustard seed of faith. Because Jesus goes on and says, all things are possible for one who believes. Right away it says that the Father just, he quickly says, well, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. This was the, the greatest amount of humility that we see. That he doesn't have it all together. I want to believe. Please help my belief. That's simply really where God wants most of us, if not all of us. I don't have it all together. And all of a sudden, Jesus begins to to not only just have a a patience for this situation, but begins to practice this patience by bringing in kindness into the situation. Kindness is is often called as uh, as a generosity, practicing it. Um, It's a generosity to to people who don't really deserve it. When you're kind to someone. This father who doesn't really quite know what's going on, he's frustrated, he's upset. If you can help me out. And then all of a sudden, Jesus displays a kindness to this father who's really quite undeserving to it. Who's kind of doubting him. And yet, Jesus heals the boy. He casts him out. He rebukes the unclean spirit. There's a, good, there's a kindness that is happening here from Jesus. Something that is undeserving. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2. Is that up there? There we go. Simply says, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. It's very simple, a very simple faith, just a pittance of faith is all that God was asking, all that Christ was asking of the Father. This was this kindness. If I can, and and suddenly the Father's, yes, I believe you can, but show me, help me, display some kindness to me so I can get this a little more shored up for me. The Scriptures actually say it is God's kindness that draws us to repentance. God's kindness. This kindness is, is something that God shows us, that draws us, that calls us. It's a sense of peace or joy, a satisfaction that God gives to us. It is a kindness that draws us to Him. The great kindness that God has shown us is in Christ. It's the gospel. It's the good news. This is God's kindness to us, something that we are undeserving of. And yet God went out of his way, much out of his way, to bring Christ, to bring forgiveness, to bring hope. It was God's kindness that brought Christ and his forgiveness. It was undeserved, and yet he brought it. The challenge is, is how are we being kind? How are we practicing this type of kindness when it comes to making disciples, when it comes to reaching the lost, when it comes to missions, if you will? How kind are we to those that are maybe doubtful, antagonistic even to the Christian faith? Are we still showing kindness to them? To the agnostics who have the doubts and the skepticisms? To the atheists who simply just simply refuse. How kind are we to these individuals? Trying to show them the kindness that God showed us by drawing us to repentance. One of the amazing stories of uh, uh, one of the, uh, I guess, evangelistic sort of fellows who were out there by the name of Ray Comfort. I mean, you heard of him, the way of the master. And uh, he's, he's always, always kind of uh, trying to encourage He's always trying to lovingly debate a lot of these atheists, if you will. And uh, and one of them, uh, uh, Dawkins, is a a well-known atheist who's, him and Ray Comfort are always kind of chiding each other. And after each and every debate, Ray Comfort has made it a point 
to send a huge fruit basket to Dawkins every time, no matter how the debate went, no matter how, and he just says, I'm just trying to show loving kindness to this guy, right? That we shouldn't just be simply be at odds. He's never won this fellow over to, the, to Christ, as it were, but he continues to show kindness, even to somebody who is so antagonistic to Christ, to Christianity, to God. How do we show kindness like that to those that are maybe hostile, to those that have great doubts? How can we help them overcome their unbelief? Through kindness, through gestures of kindness. Finally, goodness. Uh, Goodness. So the disciples could not cast out. They were unable to cast out the the, the demon from the boy. And they finally asked the question, how can, why could we not cast him out? Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus just gets to the end of it in, the, in verse 29. He says, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Um, some have actually debated. Uh, some manuscripts have actually included and fasting on the end of that. Most manuscripts don't include that, so a lot of references and translations won't have it in there. But Jesus simply says, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And so we begin to under, try to understand why the disciples couldn't do it. Jesus had given them the authority to cast out demons, to, to heal the sick. Why was this one so different? Why was this scenario so much different in it? I think it comes down to this idea of goodness, of goodness. We often think of Jesus as good. He's the good teacher. He's the good shepherd. When modern people think about Jesus, what do you think about Jesus? Well, he's a pretty good person. It was good. There's always a goodness about Jesus. No matter how they feel about his claims to be the Son of God, there's always a goodness about Jesus. But this goodness that Paul talks about in this fruit of goodness, um, again, talks about something so much deeper than we think in our own modern language today. In fact, this word beneficent is actually this this word, this meaning of, of goodness. This means somebody who produces good on behalf of somebody else, that you're, you're giving it away, that you're a, you're a conduit of goodness. And so we think about Christ, who's obviously the, uh, the, the, benef- the ben- beneficent of goodness. It is through Christ that goodness comes. The opposite of, of uh, beneficent is maleficent. Anybody heard of maleficent before? She's a Disney character from Sleeping Beauty. She is all about producing evil. She wants evil. She wants wrath. She wants to produce bad things for people. But it is Christ who overcomes that. He is the one who wants to produce goodness in us. And I think the disciples have forgotten that in this passage. Remember, they've forgotten the father and the boy altogether, and they've gone off to debate religion and doctrine. They've forgotten who in whose name the power comes through. It is Christ. Jesus says, if you give a cup of cold water in my name, you're doing good in my name. James talks about the prayers of a righteous person. Well, who is righteous? None are righteous except for Christ, who is our righteousness. The disciples have simply forgot about it. They simply think that it's just another random thing and just, oh, it's just another demon. Well, you know, we'll just snap our fingers and it'll be okay. They have forgot that goodness only comes from Christ. That we are the the, the beneficiaries of Christ's benevolence and beneficence. They had forgotten this. And this is why they're in this great debate of why we could not do it. And Jesus says, you've got to go back to prayer. Who are they praying? They're praying in the name of Christ. Anything you ask in my name, Jesus says, it will be done. They'd forgotten to go back into that. If you take into the idea of fasting, what were they trying to fast for? Is to, to again bridge that gap between their own desires and their relationship with Christ. That's what fasting is all about. They had forgotten. They had forgotten from which that goodness comes and from which that power comes in their lives. It's forgotten about Christ. That was one of the great things 
over this weekend of uh, the ministries that we saw, particularly last night, uh, dealing with inner city in Saskatoon, was their emphasis upon the gospel. It was the gospel that changes lives. It was the gospel that changes lives for the men and the women at the bridge. It was the gospel that changes the kids' lives in, in the, at the, the hands-on. And we got to see that probably at Gospel Echoes, too. It's the gospel that changes people's lives in prison. All the volunteers and all the help and all the funds, these are tools to get the gospel to the people. But it's the gospel that changes lives. That is our mission, to proclaim the gospel, to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing and teaching them to obey the things of Christ. That is our mission. That is mission one for the disciple of Christ to proclaim that gospel, to get the good news, because that is the only power that matters. And sometimes it takes waiting. Sometimes it takes patience, great patience. And it's not just passive waiting. It is practicing waiting by showing kindness, by showing goodness. And so that it takes deep roots within people's lives. I was reminded last night of a passage of Scripture in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Not very far from the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5. And Paul simply says this, And let us not grow weary of doing good. You see the patience in there? Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Who is God calling you to? Practice patient perseverance. Talking to them about the gospel. Building friendships and relationships so that they know the hope. They know the power of Christ to change lives. Who is God calling you to practice goodness and kindness to them? Showing them the power of God in Christ so that a great harvest will be done for the glory of God. Practice these things while we await Christ's glorious return. Practice them. Make disciples. Be on mission everywhere for Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for, uh, well, we thank you for your patience for us. Lord God, you know more days than I care to admit. I, I, I thank you for your patience in my own life. Lord God, the, uh, the stubbornness, the, um, the, the doubt, um, the lack of trust sometimes. I, like that father, have prayed that help my unbelief. Help me to see the next steps. Help me to know that even after months and years of praying for people, discipling, coming alongside people, that there will be fruit someday. But God, you know that because you've seen it in our lives. Lord, over the years as we stumble and we fall, over the years you pick us up, you dust us off, and you show amazing, loving patience, kindness, undeserved kindness, You protect us and provide for us, drawing us to yourself. And to know that it comes from you. We are the beneficiaries of your benevolence to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord God, I pray that you would help us not to uh, just to hold it for our own. But God, help us to have hearts for those that are across the street, that are in our, in our towns and in our communities that are in downtown Saskatoon, that are in Mexico City, that are all around the world that need to know the good news of Jesus Christ to bring healing and hope, to bring forgiveness and eternal life. Lord, put names and faces onto our hearts, those that you want us to reach out to, 
Lord, for those that we've been at it for years, family members and friends, God, I pray that you would remind us that sometimes it is with patience that doors open up. Help us to to, to persevere in these things so that at the end of it, there may be great rebirth. Celebrations for new creations in Christ. New people. Your kingdom being built. God, impassion us. Burden us with the lost. We ask and pray this power in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, our coming King.